Well, hello there, everyone. It's time now to talk about the dangers of performing a paracentesis. Don't get too worked up about this topic, because in general, bedside paracentesis is very low risk and has very few complications. After completing this module, you will be able to, one, recognize possible complications of performing a paracentesis when they occur, two, understand important steps to helping avoid these complications, and three, manage complications of a paracentesis when they arise. This is a list of the complications that will be covered in this instructional video. Let's get started. Acidic fluid leakage is the most common complication following paracentesis. As found in several studies, it occurs in approximately 5% of patients. Leaks typically arise for several reasons. One, when a Z-track has not been performed properly. Two, when a large bore needle has been used, such as is customary in a large volume paracentesis for therapeutic purposes, and or three, when a large skin incision has been created. This complication will be noticeable right away on physical exam of the catheter entry site immediately after removal of the catheter or needle that was being used to perform the procedure. You'll see a steady leak of acidic fluid visible from that site. Don't become too concerned. With acidic fluid leaks, placing gauze dressings over the site typically just leads to rapid soaking of the dressings, multiple dressing changes, and eventual maceration of the skin. If leakage of acidic fluid is allowed for an extended period of time, cellulitis may develop on the skin near the leak, and rarely retrograde infection of the acidic fluid occurs. To help prevent these leaks, a technique known as the Z-Track technique should be used when placing your large paracentesis needle into the peritoneal cavity. To do this, you first retract down on the superficial skin layer before piercing that initial layer of skin with your perineedle. This creates what is called a Z-Track. In this method, the cutaneous tissue is pulled a centimeter or two caudad prior to needle insertion and advancement through the peritoneum. When the catheter is withdrawn at the end of the procedure, the cutaneous entry site will retract to its original position, acting as a self-sealing skin patch over the puncture site through the peritoneum, which can help to reduce the incidence of acidic fluid leakage after the procedure. This method is demonstrated very clearly in the step-by-step -step video as well. When a leak does occur, there are several options at your disposal. Placing an ostomy bag over the leak site is often the preferred option. This allows quantitation of the amount of fluid that is leaking and allows for eventual resolution of the leak naturally and without further trauma to the area. With an ostomy bag in place, the acidic fluid leak is allowed to heal and stop on its own and almost always does so without further intervention. If the patient is diuretic sensitive, giving diuretics can assist in shifting fluid from the peritoneal space and hastening resolution of acidic fluid leakage. If the fluid is refractory to diuretic therapy, another therapeutic paracentesis may need to be performed using proper technique in order to reduce the positive pressure forces in the peritoneal cavity that are perpetuating the leak. If there is a large scalpel incision at the site, it can be sutured shut to help stop the leak as well. This is often the quickest fix and also typically quite successful. While the use of wound glue has not been studied as a method of stopping acidic fluid leakage, in theory, it can also serve as a way of helping with skin closure from a scalpel nick and thus helping to resolve the leakage of acidic fluid as well. Um, here's a picture of a craftily fashioned O2 nasal cannula blowing air on an acidic fluid leak that has been closed with wound glue. Uh, this is very resourceful, but again, uh, this is only anecdotal. As discussed previously in the Indications and Contraindications video, an elevated INR even greater than 2.5 and thrombocytopenia even as low as 20,000 platelets have not shown an increased risk of bleeding in patients receiving a paracentesis and reversal of coagulopathies prior to the procedure is not necessary. However, caution is warranted in patients with an INR beyond 4.0 and a platelet count less than 20. To help avoid bleeding complications, use the smallest needle that is necessary to perform the procedure. The choice of the needle depends upon whether a diagnostic or therapeutic paracentesis is planned. 
A diagnostic paracentesis can be performed in a lean patient with a 1 or 1.5 inch 22 gauge needle, while a 3.5 inch 22 gauge spinal needle can be used for diagnostic paracentesis in an obese patient. For a therapeutic paracentesis, rightfully so, a larger 15 or 16 gauge, which is 6 to 8 French size needle is used to speed the removal of acidic fluid, and that's okay. Just be aware of the increased risk for bleeding complications when the larger needle is required for use during a large volume paracentesis. We also specifically avoid plastic sheath needles. When these needles are used with the Z-Track technique, or really any time these needles are used, there is a danger of shaving off part of the sheath into the abdominal wall or abdomen if the sharp inner component is reintroduced after it has been initially withdrawn. And retrieval of the plastic sheath could require laparotomy or laparoscopy, neither of which is well tolerated in patients with advanced liver disease. In addition, plastic needle sheaths are rather large in diameter and thus have the potential to create larger holes in vessels or bowel if they are entered. Now selecting the best needle entry site is the next thing that should be taken into consideration when trying to avoid bleeding complications. In the midline and just lateral to the umbilicus, abdominal wall collateral vessels may be present, so those are the areas that should be avoided. Consider using the method shown in the figure on this slide to help in choosing a site that is away from major vessels. The anterior superior iliac spine should be located and a site chosen that is two finger breadths or about three centimeters medial and two finger breadths or about three centimeters cephalad to this anatomical landmark. Keep in mind that the epigastric artery can be three millimeters in diameter and under a lot of blood pressure with no way of applying effective external pressure if it is severed. It can bleed massively if punctured with a large caliber needle. Thus, this site should be specifically avoided. Bleeding from an artery or vein that is impaled by the needle can be severe and potentially fatal. The patient may complain of increasing abdominal pain as the first symptom of a bleeding complication. Bruising or bleeding may be easily visible and abdominal distension may develop as possible signs of an intra-abdominal bleed. Imaging and labs should be ordered immediately if this complication is suspected in order to detect it and locate the site of bleeding. A drop in PCV as well as a drop in blood pressure with corresponding elevation and heart rate are also all signs that will develop as a result of a severe bleeding complication. In the abdominal CT images seen here, you have an example of an abdominal rectus sheath hematoma and an intra-abdominal hemorrhage with fluid line. Packed red blood cells should be given to replace any intravascular losses and coagulopathies should be reversed with FFP and platelets. Emergency general surgery consultation should be placed emergently as well. An external figure of 8 suture may need to be placed surrounding the needle entry site if the inferior epigastric artery is suspected to be bleeding and rarely a laparotomy is required to control the hemorrhage. Bowel and or bladder perforation during paracentesis occurs in approximately 6 in every 1,000 taps. Fortunately, it usually does not lead to clinical peritonitis and is generally well tolerated without need for surgical intervention. Treatment is not required unless the patient develops signs of infection or unless the perforation leads to a surgical abdomen. Again, choosing the best site is key in avoiding these complications. Take your time when looking for a good needle insertion site with the ultrasound. Consider this prospective study that found that the abdominal wall was thinner in the left lower quadrant than in the midline and that the pool of fluid was deeper in the left lower quadrant as compared to the right lower quadrant. This has led to the left lower quadrant being the preferred site of entry. By contrast, the right lower quadrant is less desirable since it may have an appendectomy scar or a floating cecum filled with gas as is found in many patients, especially those with liver failure, taking laxulose. Keep in mind that surgical scars may be associated with bowel that is tethered to the abdominal wall by adhesions, thus putting the patient at risk for bowel injury if the paracentesis is performed near a scar. That being said, the right lower quadrant may be a perfectly fine needle entry site if it has been identified as a suitable site after careful ultrasound examination. 
Sometimes it can be helpful to have the patient roll slightly to his or her left to permit pooling of fluid in that area as air-filled loops of bowel float away from the area when a patient is rolled slightly to that side. The next thing that can be done to prevent damage to internal organs is simply using the safety synthesis kits that are provided at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Our paracentesis kits are equipped with special needles that help prevent harm to intra-abdominal organs. If you look carefully at the end of the needle that threads through the pigtail catheter, you will notice that it has a blunted, retractable, obturator end. When the needle is advanced through the tough layers of the abdominal wall, the blunt, obturator end is retracted back by the pressure of the tissue to reveal the sharp bevel that will then cut through the abdominal wall. Then, once the needle has reached the intraperitoneal space, the blunt obturator end redeploys back to its original position to protect internal organs from coming in contact with the sharp beveled tip of the needle, even with further advancement of the needle. If despite using these safety measures, somehow significant harm is still caused to internal organs, the first sign of a complication will come in the form of the patient complaining of symptoms of abdominal pain and on physical exam, they may demonstrate peritoneal signs or peritonitis. Abdominal imaging should be obtained immediately and an emergency general surgery consultation should be placed. In the case of a bladder rupture, urology consultation may be preferred or should also be made in addition to getting surgical services involved. Here in this image, you can see extra peritoneal fluid after a bladder rupture. The topic of colloid replacement to prevent effective hypovolemia and post-procedure hypotension after large volume paracentesis remains somewhat controversial. Reports of post-procedural hypotension after large volume para are as high as 21% in some studies, but these studies all define large volume paras as the removal of greater than 5 liters. Colloid is not necessary for paracentesis of 5 liters or less and has shown no benefit. The optimal dose of albumin solution has not been well studied, but typically patients are given 6 to 8 grams of albumin for every liter of fluid removed above 5 liters. There are two formulations of albumin solution available at Vanderbilt. The 25% solution is typically given if the patient is hypervolemic, whereas the 5% solution is given if dehydration is suspected. This evidence-based practice comes from a widely quoted study in which 105 patients with 10 societies undergoing large volume paracentesis were randomly assigned to receive albumin solution or no albumin solution. Patients not receiving albumin were more likely to show signs of hemodynamic deterioration, including an increase in the plasma renin activity, and these patients were also much more likely to develop worsening renal function and or severe hyponatremia. In the rare event that you have lost a piece of tubing intra-abdominally due to equipment failure, be sure to order the proper imaging study to locate the missing hardware. Typically most hardware in the kits can be identified on plain films and a surgical team will need to be involved for removal. Don't try to go fishing it out by yourself. Now I'm sure all this talk about the dangers of paracentesis has made you never want to attempt one. But don't fret and consider how rare these complications really are if the proper safety measures are kept in place. Death due to paracentesis is exceedingly rare, zero in most series. In the two largest series there were a total of 9 deaths out of 5,244 procedures. Mortality rate is at 0.16% to 0.39%. Eight of the deaths were due to bleeding and one was due to infection. Just be safe and mindful of what you're doing. Follow the steps in this module and you will thoroughly enjoy the instant gratification that comes with making a diagnosis and offering immediate relief to your patients safely with your new skills at performing a bedside paracentesis. Thank you for watching. Now get out there and enjoy yourselves.